My guest today is the returning champion, Philip Goff. He's a professor of philosophy at Durham University. His research focuses on consciousness and the ultimate nature of reality. Goff is best known for defending panpsychism, the view that consciousness pervades the universe and is a fundamental feature of it. On that theme, Goff has published three books, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness, which is what he was on this show for, gosh, was that four years ago, Philip? Anyway, several Three years or ago. Four, I think, yeah. yeah. And a co-edited volume is Consciousness Everywhere, Essays on Pan-Psychism. Goff has published many academic articles as well as writing extensively for newspapers and magazines, including Scientific American, The Guardian, and, and Eon, and Times Literary Supplement. Here's the new book, Why the Purpose of the Universe. Philip, nice to see you again. I gather this is something of a sequel to the Galileo's Error project. Good to see you, Michael. Good, good to be back on after three or four years, I think it's been. Um, yeah, yeah some, it's somewhat a sequel. In some ways, there's still partly a focus on consciousness and panpsychism in certain respects. Although I think it's also a significantly different book. The, the, the central theme, I think, is is a little bit different to... The Galileo's era book. So this is a, it's not, actually not a book I would have imagined myself writing when I last spoke to you four years ago. It's been a little bit of a journey to get here, changing my mind about a lot of things. And in a way, it's a it's a more radical book than I than I would have imagined writing previously. But I've just been following the arguments, and this is where I've ended up. Well, I've yeah, I've, I've followed some of your critics' comments on your previous book. One of which seemed to be, "What is this adding?" To the conversation, what what do I get by adopting panpsychism? So my sense with this book is, well, actually, it can give you a whole new worldview that builds purpose into the universe. Something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I think everyone thinks you have to fit into the dichotomy of either you believe in the god of traditional Western religion, or you're a Richard Dawkins style secular atheist. You know. Uh, you know, it's like which side are you on, Richard Dawkins or the Pope? You know, and and you know, I was raised Catholic. Actually, I you know I gave that up pretty early when I was fourteen. I decided I was an atheist, and you know I was quite happily in that team secular for a long time. But just very recently, I guess I've slowly come to think that both of these worldviews are inadequate. Both of them have things they can't explain, and. And this is what this book is doing, really, exploring questions of uh, contemporary cosmology, cutting edge work on consciousness to show actually there's, there's just big problems with both of these views. And it's time to explore the much neglected middle ground. But yeah, I, I suppose you can see it as partly a, 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 an application of panpsychism. And, and, you know, part of the stuff I'm addressing is is just empirical data rather than uh, ph- as well as philosophical considerations. So, yeah. All right. Here, here you are on page one. Uh, chapter one is titled, What's the Point of Living? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Good question. <laughs> you have my attention. I... <laughs> yeah. I don't have a copy uh, yet. You've got a copy. It's fantastic. It's the no, first time I'm looking well, at it. It's, it's the, well, it's the, <laughs> it's it's the, the uh, reader's the advanced copy uh, proof copy. Yeah, I don't have the, it doesn't come with the four, four color pictures on the inside. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. So here's how you start. One day, all of the energy in the universe will be used up. The stars will all go out. All matter will be swallowed up by black holes, black holes that will eventually evaporate away. This will be the beginning of an infinitely long epoch in which all activity and interaction has ceased. There will never again be intelligent life anywhere forevermore. Oh, man, that's a cheery uh, (laughs) outline there. (laughs) Well, yeah, it's the big question that I think it ought to keep everyone awake at night. You know, the idea that at some point, no matter how distant in the future, all the energy will be used up, the stars will go out, and that will be no more intelligent life forever, ever anymore. Actually, I do put in a footnote before people say, oh, this goff guy is ignorant of science. There are, of course, other scientific models Roger Penrose has, you know, recurring universes. Um, there's also the idea that eventually through random fluctuations, other universes may emerge. Actually, actually, what I say in the following line is, is this is 
uh, a quote, uh, the idea, the press by the Christian philosopher William Lane Craig, that without God, everything's pointless. And and that's one extreme view on the on the purpose of existence. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I find myself ultimately in a in a what what I so most of the book is is not about you know what this means for human existence. It's just about the as it were cold blooded scientific and philosophical questions. But on the on the question of, of what does all this mean for human existence, I find myself in a middle way between two extremes. So so one extreme, you've got the William Lane Craig without a purpose to the universe. Life is totally pointless. We might he even says we might as well kill each other. Uh, the other extreme, you've got um, s- typical typical secular humanist position that no. It, whether there's a purpose to the universe or not would be totally irrelevant, totally irrelevant to the meaning of our lives. We just make our own meaning and that's it. I try to have a middle way where, yeah, I do think life can be meaningful with without cosmic purpose. You know, if you live a life with kindness and creativity and the pursuit of knowledge and, and so on. But if there is cosmic purpose, if there is, if it does turn out to be a, a purpose to the universe, Maybe that can allow for certain slightly deeper modes of existence and engagement with the reality behind us. So I always like the middle ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let me punch home what William Lane Craig argues. Because you and I both stumbled across Alvy's uh, Alvy Singer example that I'll get to in a minute. Yeah. So I actually titled one of my Scientific American columns, Alvy's Error, Assessing the Purpose of Something at the Wrong Level of, of Analysis. So here's where I came up with this. I watched this debate between William Lane Craig and the uh, Yale philosopher Shelley Kagan. So here is Craig outlining what the universe is like without God. On a naturalistic worldview, everything is ultimately destined to destruction in the heat death of the universe. As the universe expands, it grows colder and colder as its energy is used up. Eventually, all the stars will burn out. All matter will collapse into dead stars and black holes. There will be no life, no heat, no light. Only the corpses of dead stars and galaxies expanding into endless darkness. In the light of that, it and it's hard for me to understand how our moral choices have any sort of significance. There's no moral accountability. The universe is neither better nor worse for what we do. Our moral lives become vacuous because they don't have that kind of cosmic significance. And then he gives examples from the Holocaust and Hitler and genocide So on, he says, none of that matters. And then Kagan properly nails him, saying, this strikes me as an outrageous thing to suggest. It doesn't really matter. Surely it matters to the torture victims, whether they're being tortured. It doesn't require that this makes some sort of cosmic difference to the eternal significance of the universe for it to matter whether a human being is tortured. It matters to them, matters to their family, and it matters to us. So, I, you know, I think uh, Alvy's error is that, you know, Alvy Singer... Uh, Woody Allen's character in Annie Hall has that flashback. He won't do his homework. Why? Because the universe is expanding. The universe is expanding. What, at some point, it's all going to blow up. So what, what difference does it make if I do my homework and his mother upbraids him? <clears throat> you know, what's the universe got to do with it? We live in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn's not expanding. right? So it's a wrong level of analysis. But what you've articulated there in your opening page is what most theists think. You know, if that's it, what's the point of all this? And so I was just trying to argue kind of the humanist position. Well, the here and now is what matters. It doesn't matter whether it be 14 billion years from now what happens. Yeah, it's it's not only uh, religious people who think that, actually. They, if you ever come across the anti-natalist philosopher, David Oh, my God, David that section Benatar. in your book. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so he thinks, gotta, he thinks yeah. Uh, life is, is uh, he doesn't think it's entirely pointless, but it's it's so pointless that it's actually, he thinks, immoral to have children. He doesn't think we should kill ourselves now we're here because that would be wrong too. But we, the, the morally correct thing is, is to let the human race die out. And this has actually become sort of a religion in its own right. There was this guy in India who tried to sue his parents for bringing him yes. into existence. <laughs> it got that kicked out so of court funny. eventually. But uh, um, yeah, so, so but you know, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, that is a rather extreme view. I also think maybe Craig is mixing up two slightly different things there whether there's objective value, objective morality with whether there's a purpose to the universe. And of course, he grounds both of these things in God. 
But in principle, they're separable, and, and many, many atheist philosophers might not think there's a purpose to the universe, but they still think there are objectively better or worse things, as you say, in the here and now. So yeah, I, I think we can have meaningful lives in the here and now without cosmic purpose. But if there is cosmic purpose, maybe our lives can be a little bit more meaningful. I mean, we want to make a difference, I think, in life. You want to make a difference. If you could make some difference to the, the good purposes of the whole of reality, even in some small way, you know, that's about as big a difference as, as, as you can imagine making. So, so yes, meaning, can ex- meaning does exist without cosmic purpose, but with cosmic purpose and in relation to cosmic purpose, potentially, we can live a more meaningful form of existence, perhaps. Yeah, the anti-natalist. Yeah, I, I was just couldn't believe what I was reading in that section in your book, uh, that people could actually argue that. But then again, there's, you know, the effective altruists who argue, well, if I make a billion dollars now in my lifetime and, and, and uh, pledge 10% of it, I'm doing a lot more, 10, 10% to social causes or whatever, I'm doing a lot more good now than than I could if I was just had a regular income. So I should go out and try to become a billionaire. <laughs> it's like, okay, dude, really, you need that excuse? <laughs> uh, or, you know, that, you know, future people are just as valuable as current people. It's like, you know, get out of your armchair and go outside and look at the world and just, what does it really look like? What do people need now? Yeah, yeah, philosophers can get wrapped up in complicated, abstract ways of thinking about the world. You get sort of lost in rabbit holes rather than, as you say, going out experiencing the world, relationships, people, creativity, kindness. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's got to be the starting point. Although, you know, as a philosopher, I'm not, I'm not afraid of a little bit of abstract thinking every now and again. I mean, a lot of the al- al- altruistic... Um, I mean, effective altruism is very interesting. I think there is an interesting project of trying to think about the most effective ways of making the world better, and I think there's there's a role for that. But um, yeah, maybe there's yeah, a, a bit yeah, of the, the ration, the, yeah, the the rational allocation of resources makes sense. Yeah, and I like Peter Singer's uh, what is it the, the the good you can do today, whatever that group is called. You know, where they really calculate where your dollars are going now. You know, to overhead payroll buildings or to the poor people in Africa that need it right now. You know, that, yeah. that I, I think is good. Um, okay. So let's, let's start with the, the big God hypothesis that, you know, the traditional theist answer to what's the purpose of the universe. Well, God, God gives us that purpose an outside source. What's wrong with that argument. So let me just tee it up for you. You know, there, uh, the only way to explain the fine tuning of the universe, why there's something rather than nothing, you know, the I DNA, just take your pick at some complex, system that can't be explained, they think, through Darwinian gradualism because of uh, of all the built-in complexity in which all the parts had to be there at the same time and so on and so forth. Why is there consciousness? Why is there a, a moral sense of right and wrong? You Darwinians don't have a good answer to that. Uh, and, of course, the ultimate, you know, why is there something rather than nothing, where the Big Bang come from and so on? God is the inference to the best explanation, is how they say that. And then from there, you're off and running to Jesus died for your sins and all the rest. What's wrong with that argument? Well, on the, on the, on the biological intelligent design stuff, I don't really have anything to comment because I feel that's just uh, an issue in biology that's outside of my area of expertise. And I suppose as a non-biologist, I have to go with the consensus view, which is that the, the um, intelligent design in biology doesn't really doesn't really cut the cut the stuff. Um, as as for these other arguments, particularly the fine tuning, um, I, I I think there's something here. I think there's some force to these considerations. Actually, I I mean I I started on this book when I was um, I came to my current university five years ago, and they asked me to teach philosophy of religion, and it's uh, you know it was a typical traditional course. You teach the arguments against God. You teach the arguments for God. And then the students have to work out which they find more compelling and write their essay. So I taught the arguments against God. I thought, yeah, very compelling. Definitely no God. And then I taught the arguments for God. And I was like, hold on a minute. 
I think some of these arguments are pretty good as well, particularly the the fine tuning one. And I was in a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a quandary for a while about how to make sense of this. Um, but so God is a solution, I would say, to these many challenges: fine tuning, something rather than nothing, and so on. But it's not a very good one, and and the reason it's not a very good one is is an old familiar one: the problem of evil and suffering. It just does. It's this is you know this has been a philosophical view that I've found compelling as long as I can remember. One of the most compelling philosophical arguments. I just do not find it plausible that a loving God who could do anything would create a universe with so much gratuitous suffering in. You know, bring why bring into existence the the North American long tail shrew that paralyzes its prey and then slowly eats them over several days until they eventually die from their wounds. You know what? What's the point of that? <laughs> that kind of makes <laughs> makes no makes no sense to me. Or choose to bring us into existence through such a long-winded, torturous process like natural selection. Um, so yeah, so I think so. Basically, I think there's there's things the theist can't explain evil and suffering. There's things, but there's also things the atheist can't explain, like fine tuning. And we need to be honest and and find. Find a hypothesis that can account for all of these data points. Yeah, Darwin used uh, the example of the ichneumonid wasp that stings the caterpillar that paralyzes it, lays its eggs at the bottom end of the body, and then the eggs hatch and the hatchlings eat their way up to the brain. What kind of a brain a, 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 a caterpillar has in any case until it finally dies from that. And, you know, Darwin is like, this is pretty cruel. This is nasty. And this is what nature is mostly like. And then, of course, he was, you know, the personal uh, loss of his own daughter, Annie, affected him deeply. I think probably, um, you know, Janet Brown, his biographer, thinks that that's what put the nail in the coffin to his theism. And he was never an atheist, really. That wasn't really a big thing in his time. He called himself an agnostic after the term, which was a term invented by uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, his friend, to mean not knowable. Not that we know there is no God, just it's not a knowable thing through science. So just leave it out of the equation, so to speak. Um, yeah, so I was going to read it. I'm glad you quoted Stephen Fry because I've seen him actually give this. I think this was on stage with Hitchens when they were debating a couple of theists where he says what he'd say to God. I'd say, bone cancer in children. What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that it's not our fault? It's not right? It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capacious, capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain. Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to bur burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that? <laughs> you could as e easily have made a creation in which that didn't exist. It's simply not acceptable. Wow. Yeah, it's very powerfully... I think it was on I Irish TV, actually. I well, it, the mm. clip I saw that I okay, quoted in right. that, uh, which had millions of views on, um, and the presenter, the look of the, you check it mm. out, the look on the the face of the presenter, this uh, <laughs> this Irish yeah. presenter is uh, quite priceless. But uh, yeah, it's very very vividly put, very vividly put. Um, I mean, if I was going to be a pedantic philosopher, which I sometimes am, I'd say the way he puts it. I mean, if God exists as Christians, Muslims, Jews define God, then God is perfectly good. So he won't be mean minor. The, 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 if God exists, there will be some explanation of why there's this terrible suffering. I don't know. I have no idea what that would be. But if God exists, the, God is good by definition. There must be an explanation. Uh, I often get this off, on Twitter off theists actually say, oh, you're applying your human moral standards to God. And my answer to that is, yeah, if God exists, then, you know, God's standards are right, not mine. But the trouble is, we don't know if God exists, and so we've got to do our best to, to, to have our best guess as to whether God exists. Uh, and where are we going to start having our best guess? Well, we're obviously, we're going to use our own reason, our own moral standards. And as far as I can work out with my moral standards, the idea of a, a loving God creating a universe like this makes very little sense. Right. The theist counter to that is, well, first of all, there's the fall. 
in which you know we went from this paradisiacal state of perfection to man's original sin, and that's where free will comes in and people choose to do evil to one another. Okay, that accounts for genocide and the Holocaust and homicides and so forth. Uh, well, what about you know childhood cancer? What are these kids? Well, uh, you can't have good without evil. That is to say, for there to be a mountain, there has to be a valley. And so you got to have the one to get the other one. So these are, although you don't see the good that's built into the evil, ultimately it builds character and you know, it'll all be resolved in the next life anyway. You'll understand what God's purpose was in that thing that happened that hurt you um, and so on and so forth, you know, something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, this, there's some, some plausibility initially to the free will defense if we're talking about the harm human beings do to each other. Of course, then, but then we get straight to the harms caused by the, the natural world, C cancer, hurricanes, these terrible, gratuitous atrocities in, in the natural world. Um, the, 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 the theodicy, is, as, uh, as religious philosophers call it, theodicy being a, an attempt to give God's reasons to allow, for allowing suffering, I consider the theodicy of Richard Swinburne, who I think is a very interesting contemporary philosopher of religion. He's actually reviewing my book for the Times Literary Supplement, so I'm interested to see what his response. He's 87 now, but he's still <laughs> very active and engaged. I just saw and, him uh, last yeah, week at the totally. in at the yeah he was at that uh, How the Light Gets In festival in London. I couldn't I believe was there. it. There he was. Were you, were you there yeah. as well? I was. Yeah, there. yeah. I, I know. I missed you. We we, you we were just on crossed site? paths. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, I did a, oh. I did a oh session God. on spiritualism with two mm. Wittgen, Wittgenstein philosophers who mostly uh, consumed the conversation with comparing the young Wittgenstein to the old Wittgenstein. I felt like a, I was talk, talking to art historians talking about the young Van Gogh <laughs> versus the later Van Gogh. Anyway, it was, it was really oh, funny. We're getting into the weeds. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, I yeah. missed you there. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, Swinburne tries to expand the free will defense to deal with natural evil, evil from the natural world, bad things from the natural world. And his idea is that without the suffering from the natural world, we wouldn't face the kind of serious moral decisions we face in the real world. Decisions whether to show compassion when there's been a natural disaster, uh, or decisions whether to be courageous or not. You know, if there wasn't for natural evil, we'd live in some kind of Disneyland world where, you know, there were no serious moral choices. So even if we had free will, it wouldn't be free will of any significance. And my response to this is, even if that's right, even, even Grant Swinburne, that there are these goods that exist in the real world that wouldn't exist without natural suffering, I don't think a creator would have the right to harm people to bring about those goods. So there's a classic discussion in um, util cr critique of util very crude forms of utilitarian moral philosophy, where you have this thought experiment. Okay, what if a doctor can kill one healthy patient, harvest their organs, and save the lives of five seriously ill patients? You know, give the heart to one, the kidney to another, the lungs to another, and so on. If the doctor did that, he would have, you know, or she would have, uh, increased happiness in the world, you know, increased happiness and well-being. But we tend to think, and I certainly think, that it would not be morally acceptable for the doctor to do that because he, because the doctor infringes the right to life of the person he harmed. Likewise, I think a creator would, it would not be morally acceptable for them to create cancer and hurricanes and kill people effectively, um, because in, infringe people's right to life and liberty and security in order to bring about these goods. It would just be not be morally acceptable. So actually, I think it's an interesting discussion between me and Swinburne that it's not so much, is the world better or worse? It's like, what would a creator have the right to do? Mm. Yeah, I always like the trolley problems because they bring out the utilitarian versus deontological ethical systems you know, most yeah. people say, yeah, I, I pull the switch to to divert the trolley to, you know, kill the one to save the five. It's going to kill the five. Would you flip the switch? Yeah, yeah, that seems right. Um, you know, okay, would you kill five million Jews to save 
60 million Germans. Oh, well, no, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> right. Uh, or would you, you know, would you, would you throw the fat man off the bridge? You'd actually have to physically grab him, give him a hip check off there. You did that and he died due to your act. Well, no, that doesn't seem right, but it's the same calculation, right? You know, so at some point, I think most people hit uh, bedrock when they, yeah, the right to bodily autonomy to choose what happens to me and my body is up to me. That trumps the other ethical principles that are grounded in utilitarianism, which also have value. I just think ultimately it comes down to conflicting rights or conflicting value systems, and one of them has to go that can't have everything. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I've got a, I'm not a moral philosopher. It's not like I've got a, a totally worked out view here that, you know, right to autonomy wins out or consequences win out. I mean, I, my gut feeling is, is both are in the mix. But certainly in this case, um, you know, I don't think it would be acceptable. I mean, people say, well, God's created us. God has special rights. Swinburne, Swinburne says, actually, he makes an analogy to parents and the state. And he says, you know, it, it's okay for parents to slightly harm their children or the state to sort of slightly harm people or, oh, I don't know, we're going to get into vaccine territory quickly here. But anyway, uh, and, and similarly, God is so much greater than us. So God has certain rights to, to harm us in a much greater way. But I guess I don't buy that justification at the start. I think, I think the state does have certain rights over us. I'm not an anarchist, but I think that's more of a pragmatic thing, um, you know, that we have to run society, we have to structure society, we have to give up certain rights well, and there, so there on. Well, there are examples of that. There are examples of that in the United States where we have religious freedom, but occasionally the state does step in with, say, child neglect. Uh, Christian yeah. scientists, Jehovah Witnesses, I, no, you can't give my child that blood transfusion because it says right there in Deuteronomy and whatever. Uh, and, the, and the state will just say, but your kid is going to die. And at some point, the state will just step in and say, we are saving this child, and you are neglectful. That happens periodically, uh, but not, not often. But yeah, that's a good example. Um, well, we don't want to get into that. Well, you do have a little sidebar on taxation is taxation theft. You do touch on that a little bit, because that is kind of the anarcho-capitalist, some libertarians, all taxation is theft. You know, technically, I guess, yes, if I don't pay my income tax, well, you know, the, before, before the person comes to my door with a gun, which will eventually happen. You know, I'll get lots of letters and phone calls and, and requests to come to court and so forth. But eventually, yeah, there's a guy with a gun behind all of that, and you have to have that. Yeah, so, I mean, where the libertarian position runs into trouble, it seems to me, the, the ultra-libertarian position that taxation is theft, is when it comes to land and natural resources. You know, the libertarian position tends to focus on labor, and the idea that, you know, we freely contract our labor. And so, but, you know, so, I mean, so much of wealth depends on land and natural resources, especially in England, you know, where uh, half the land is owned by 1% of the population, basically because their ancestors were mates with Henry VIII, not Henry VIII, uh, William the Conqueror, sorry, you know, and, you know, have this extreme, incredible, unbelievable um, mass of land make a huge profit of it just because, you know, their great-great-grandparents were friends with the king. And so that makes no sense to me. I think, you know, we all have an equal right on the land and natural resources. Um, and, and so then there's a place for taxation or, or other social structures to ensure that we benefit from the land and natural resources we all have a right to. So this, I'm, I'm kind of open to the, the left libertarian position, which is not uh, often focused on, as opposed to the right libertarian position. So the left libertarian position says, okay, if you earn money from your labor, then, then you have a certain claim on that. But insofar as, and you know, but that, how often, maybe if you're a masseur, right? Or, or there's this example of, you know, if you weaved garments from your body hair, if you then it, it's just from me, so the state doesn't have the right to tax me. Left libertarians have said that you know, if you weaved garments from your body hair, the state couldn't tax them. But as far as you're using land, natural resources, then yeah, the state's got to get intervene because you've got no right to sort of take hold of more than your fair share when everyone's got an equal claim on it. Yeah, that's fair share. That's a tough one. Yeah, Henry George in the 19th century, and, and then 
Alfred Russell Wallace also, you know, favored land nationalization because of this. It isn't fair the way it worked out historically. I mean, I, I use the example of of uh, Thomas Jefferson with the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon. Well, you know, this is you know, probably trillions of dollars in land value today. You know, it's about a third of the entire United States. You know, it wasn't Napoleon's to sell and it wasn't Jefferson's to buy. You know, there are already people living there, right? But there was no such thing as property rights and contracts and things like that for the Native Americans. And so how you fix that wrong, I have no idea. I mean, something like if there's going to be reparations for African Americans, well, the Native Americans, they got uh, ripped off just as much, if not more, in terms of land value. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe maybe if we had a... And the great um, libertarian philosopher Robert Nozick cons- thought about this possibility. Maybe we have a one-off redistribution where everyone's <laughs> perfectly equal, and then we go from there, and then inequalities are justified after that. Okay, there'd be some plausibility <laughs> to that. But as we are now, with all this historical baggage in the past, and also, you know, if you're a libertarian, like the state is constantly messing around with the distribution, and so that supposedly natural distribution is just gone, has never been there. And so the idea that in the real world, you can say, oh, the state has no right to tax me. Why? No, that just makes no sense because there's no, you know, the money you get is from a highly socially constructed, contingent, shaped in all sorts of ways market. And so there's no moral significance to the, you know, the money a hedge fund man- manager happens to get in their paycheck as opposed to, you know, a healthcare worker or something like that. So, hmm. Yeah, I think it was Robert Frank, the economist, that makes the point to anarcho-capitalists. Okay, so you get rid of taxation. So you're not going to have an army or military or police, except for whatever you can hire privately. And so the neighboring country just invades you and takes over and then starts taxing you. So one way or the other, you're paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the more extreme version. So there are, uh, there's a milder version. I think Nozick's version, you just have the army. You just pay for the army. I mean, what it is, it's not freedom, is it? It's property rights. It's, that's what, I think it's a bit of a misnomer, libertarianism, as though it's about freedom. It's about protecting property rights. But <laughs> right. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I tend to think property rights are just social constructions. I like to uh, borrow from the quote from Jesus. You know, Jesus said, man is made, this, which way around is it? The Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I think property rights are made for humanity, not humanity for property rights. We should shape property rights and taxation in order to have as healthy and happy and society as possible in which people are free and prosper and get the most out of life. Yeah, no, you're right. The libertarian core uh, is property rights and contracts and uh, some kind of judicial system to resolve disputes when we have disputes over our property or, or contracts. Um, And one of the first things you got to do in a a developing nation to make it a developed nation is to bring in the rule of law and property rights and contracts and a judicial system. So people trust the system that if I start this business and invest in it, buy this house and so on, it's not going to just be taken away from me by the next dictator that comes in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And, you know, it's kind of weird that I got into this in this book. As you say, there's a little uh, sidebar, a little... (laughs) what do you call it, addendum on. I mean, the reason that got included, actually, because I, I mean, I talk about whether there's, in, in the final chapter, whether there's a connection between spiritual progress and political struggle. And I talked a little bit about this stuff. And the, my editor said, this looks like it's just people talking in a pub. You know, you need to show you <laughs> there's some more substance behind your research here. So he made me add this. Um, well, it's actually a reprint of, a, of an article I wrote on um you know the nature of property and so on so it's a bit of an odd there's all sorts in this book there's all sorts of different stuff but oh it's uh, super yeah, it's interesting a... now you t- you touch on <laughs> we're going to get to this consciousness free will all this great stuff just one more point on that I, I i often make a distinction between empirical scientific truths that we can get at through data and research and rationality and so on and then there's like religious truths you know jesus died for your sins well there's no experiment we're going to run or you know whatever that's just a you know kind of a religious a dogma. And then there's political truths. Like what's the right number of people we should let in across our borders every year? There is no right number. It's just well, who's in power. What, which, how much does the party want immigrants to come in? And you know, what are the values of the country 
in terms of, say, tech development, so we want to let in a lot of people that are good at tech, whatever. Or what's the right percentage of upper income tax, speaking of taxing? Uh, well, what is it you want to do? Okay, so that seems kind of arbitrary, but on the other hand, you know, if you track, say, the centuries-long development of moral progress, a lot of it is based on this idea that you know, the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. We want everybody to have, you know, a basic good life that reduces suffering. Not everybody has to have an iPhone 15, right? But you got to have three square meals a day and health care and so on. Most Western industrialized democracies have a pretty hefty safety net social redistribution, about 20% of GDP on average. Most European countries are a little higher, the United States a little lower but they all allocate a certain amount with the idea that there are some people that can't take care of themselves. Uh, you know, they're handicapped or mentally ill or addicted or whatever the problem is, that, that's never gonna go away. And we have a moral obligation to do that and so on and so forth. That costs money. So you have to have taxation and you gotta have a certain amount to pay for all that. And we all end up with something like, I think the United States upper income tax bracket is 37% now federal and then states have different percentages, California is uh, 10%, and and so forth. And European countries, it's higher and, and so on. But the general agreement seems to be we're moving in the direction toward, is this an objective truth that we are agreeing as a society that the, what is it, survival and flourishing of sentient beings, the reduction of suffering of all people is an objective, true moral value we all agree is good and we're going to work toward that. From there, you can then deduce, well, there is a right percentage of income tax. You got to pay for this, and it's going to be a minimum of 35, maybe a maximum of 55%, something like that. Yeah, it's an interesting stat that uh, sometimes surprises people. The, the average rate of taxation on the top uh, in the US between 1930 and 1980, do you know what it was? Yeah, it was like 70%. 81%. Like 80, 81%. Yeah, 80, yeah. And 89%, I think, in the UK. And, you know, it worked. It, it didn't negatively affect the economy. This was the global age of capitalism. Sorry, the golden age of capitalism. So, yeah, I mean, my political philosophy is kind of quite simple and empirical, really. If just comparing the 30 years after the war, the Second World War, where we had high taxes at the top, strong trade unions, um, highly regulated capitalism, society got more equal, prospered, that the, the economy flourished. My parents are kind of, you know, the luckiest generation that ever lived. They've got, you know, the baby, baby boomers got so much out of this. And then the 80s onwards, we kind of slashed all that. And then it's been an absolute bloody disaster. You know, <laughs> inequality shut up. We've had crisis after crisis. 2008, it all fell to its knees. And then we've been wrestling with Brexit and Trump and all the rest since then. So, you know, I just think we were on the right lines there anyway. But yeah, Coming to, I mean, the big question of, I mean, it's a big question in the book about um, is, mor is, is are moral truths objective or or subjective? And uh, do we want to get into that at this point? I don't know. Uh, well, sure, because I think I think I think an argument can be made for objective moral truths to a certain extent. I uh, develop what I call provisional ethics or provisional morality. Now, there are moral va certain moral values that are provisionally true. Most people, most places, under most circumstances. Yes, there's always edge cases. You can find one where it doesn't fit, right? You should never lie. Yeah, well, what if the Nazi asks you if you're hiding an Anne Frank? Yes, you should lie. Okay, you know, so there's always those uh, test cases. But for the most part, you know, not lying is a good moral value, something like that. So I do think, and you can derive that from just observing what people want, right? So female genital mutilation is my example of this. You know, this is morally wrong, objectively absolutely morally wrong. And I don't care if it's a cultural relative, it's none of our business in the West with people in other countries. Yes, it is. Why? Because of back to where we started with that, you know, bodily autonomy and the you know, reduction of suffering and so on, we're committed to that. Is that objective not outside of the, you know, outside of earth or whatever, it's not out there in the ether, but it is built into human nature to want to control your body and to survive and redu reduce suffering. Something like that. That's, where, where do you take off on that? So I, I used to, I mean, I, t I talk a little bit of autobiography in the first chapter. Oh, by the way, if, just for the audience, I'm, I'm trying, my first book was a 
was an academic book. My second book was aimed at general audience. And this one, I'm trying to do both. So each yeah. chapter has a did, more... I thought you, you thought did it, it well. Okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank totally. you very much. Yeah. So each chapter yeah. has a more accessible bit and then a digging deeper bit where you can get more yeah. into the into the weeds. Um, yeah, I was worried I'm going to please nobody. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, anyway. I, thought, I thought it was perfect. Yeah, it was, it's oh, hard to do Michael. and you did it, yeah. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, I took, so I, I used to be a follower of David Hume on ethics, right? I was very impressed by the is or gap worry. You know, how do you go from cold-blooded empirical facts to facts about value? Um, and one of the most transformational moments of my graduate career was one of the professors persuading me that there was just an incoherence in Hume's view here. Um, and and the, the, the contradiction is, 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 is as follows, because yeah, on the one hand, Hume says, you can't go from an is to an ought, right? On the other hand, in another page of the same book, Hume says, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions, right? Yeah. In other words, if you desire to do something, you ought to follow through with that. If I desire to be a philosophy professor, I ought to go to, um, you know, go to graduate study, try and publish papers, whatever. But you've, you've just gone from an is to an ought. You've gone from your own desires to what you ought to do. And it doesn't feel like it because it feels like, oh, well, that's just what I want to do. But okay, but that's uh, there's still another question. What should I do? What do I have reason to do? And that's what I realized, actually, the consistent position, if you don't want to believe in objective morality, is just to say, is nihilism. It's just to say there's no reason to think or do anything. <laughs> you know, There's no reason to avoid pain. I mean, I might do it, but there's no reason to. It's neither better nor worse. There's no reason to follow evidence, right? There's nothing you ought to believe. You know, you can, why should you follow evidence? That's an ought. Right, if we can't get from an is to an ought. <laughs> yeah, so right. I, I actually tried for about a year to sort of live like that and, and live out that sort of nihilist position. Uh, but I just think ultimately it's not sustainable. So I think it's very hard to make sense of how there could be objective facts about what you ought to do, what you ought to believe. But I, I, I don't think there's any way around it. In a way, I mean, you could put it like this. Suppose you don't believe in any objective value, then there's no reason to follow the evidence. So this is not a position that you have any reason to believe. And actually, well, just very finally, quick anecdote. My, I've yeah, got a, a very good nihilist friend, uh, Bart Streumer, who's a, a, a very good Dutch philosopher. And he's a nihilist. And he's, he's you know, thought it through very analytically. And he's realized he can't consistently believe his own view. Because he thinks to believe something, you have to have a reason to think, take yourself to have a reason to believe it. But he doesn't believe in reasons. He doesn't believe in any kind yeah. of value. So, he, yeah. so, he, so all he says is the arguments point in that direction. <laughs> and he leaves it. So, so ultimately, I think it's, 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 it's ultimately an unsustainable position. When most people say they don't believe in objective morality, they mean, you know, I don't have to give a shit about the, the well-being of others if I don't want to. But, oh, I ought to care about my own well-being. But that's 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 a kind of ethical position as well, you know. So I think it is all sorts of subtle ways in which value creeps in everywhere, and it's not. I just don't think it's possible to avoid value objectivism ultimately. Does that yeah. Make sense? This yes, absolutely. Yeah. A couple things on that. You know, it's like asking, uh, can you use rationality to prove rationality is good? Well, Thomas Nagel calls that one thought too many. It's it's not it's not something to pr it's just a tool that you use, right? And so here's how Pinker puts it in Rationality. He takes on Hume. Hume is one of the heroes of his book Rationality, but uh, he addresses this is ought problem. And here's Steve. In fact, it's not hard to ground morality in reason. Hume may have been technically correct when he wrote that it's not contrary to reason to prefer global genocide to a scratch on one's pinky. But his grounds were very, very narrow. As he noted, it is also not contrary to reason to prefer bad things happening to oneself over good things, say pain, sickness, poverty, loneliness over pleasure, health, prosperity, and good company. Okay, but now let's just say irrationally, whimsically, mulishly, for no good reason at all, 
that we prefer good things to happen to ourselves over bad things. Let's make a second wild and crazy assumption that we're social animals who live with other people rather than Robinson Crusoe on a desert island. So our well-being depends on what others do, like helping us when we are in need and not harming us for no good reason. This changes everything. As soon as we start insisting to others, you must not harm me or let me starve or let my children drown, we cannot also maintain, but I can hurt you and let you starve and let your children drown and hope they will take us seriously. This is because as soon as I engage you in a rational discussion, I cannot insist that only my interests count just because I'm me and you're not any more than I can insist that the spot I'm standing on is special place in the universe just because I happen to be standing on it. The pronouns I, me, and mine have no logical heft. They flip with each turn in a conversation. And so any argument that privileges my well-being over yours or his or hers, all else being equal is irrational. <laughs> yeah, I don't buy it. I don't think this you attempt don't? to sort of construct morality out of kind of our wants or something. I mean, what? what well, it's look, a game I mean, theory. If... It's a game theory calculation. Mm. Okay, okay. So if it's just a pragmatic game theory calculation, sure, those things have a, a role to play. But if, if morality is ultimately just about what principles we decide upon, why can't I just decide that, um, you know, the men or the people from Liverpool, I'm from Liverpool, you know, have a privileged status and the other people have to be slaves to us if I can get away with enforcing that? I don't... What's the argument that uh, that's some kind of inconsistency in that. I might not be starting from well-being is good. I might be starting from my well-being is good. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going to take you seriously uh, on that argument. If you, you, know, if you say I'm special because I'm me and you're not, I'm going to go, well, good well, for you. you will if I, I, you will if I've got a big <laughs> army and I can get well, away with it. Yes, that's right. Yes. Well, historically, <laughs> yes, that's the way it's always gone. Now you have to justify it. Right. You know, that's why right. Putin so comes up with these. I yeah. see. So if it's just a pragmatic thing, like, this is what we can do to, um, you know, get by and get on. Okay, that there's obviously some reality to that. But then, you know, I, I think we do tend to think. I mean, well, here's, we, we. I think we do tend to think some things are more worth doing than others. You know, forget the grand morality stuff. The example mm -hmm. I give in the book is like counting blades of grass. But actually, I thought of a more a more kind of psychologically realistic example since I wrote yeah. the book. Think about the uh, the craving for power. And I don't mean power because of what you can do with it, just power for its own sake. I think Boris Johnson, our former prime minister, had a lot of, you know, just, just wanted, he did, I don't think he wanted to be prime minister to do anything. He just wanted to be powerful, the prime minister. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fortunate enough not, not to be too bothered about power and money, but I've got a bit of ego. You know, I can't deny I want to be sort of well-known philosopher for its own sake. Now, that kind of drive is just irrational because it's not worth pursuing. Yeah, okay, it's, maybe it's worth getting fame or power because of what you can do with it, but when it's for its own sake, that is just objectively pointless. Whereas if you do something because it feels good or because it advances your knowledge or because it ad makes someone else feel good or advances their knowledge, that's worth doing. Uh, and, and just to say that is already to be in the, the realm of objective value because we're disagreeing with Hume. We're saying, no, it's not just that all basic desires are on a par. So, you know, power and money are just the same. No, some things are worth, some desires are worth having. The desire for knowledge, the desire for truth, the desire to feel good. These are well, worth the, pursuing. Anyway, The desire not to suffer and starve Mm. Uh, and be disease-ridden, the desire for freedom instead of uh, slavery, say. Why was slavery abolished everywhere around the time that it was? Well, because of the rights revolution took off in the late 18th century, and that just tumbled right out of that, because if people have inherent rights, they're just born with them. W whether you believe in God or not, it's just in our nature. Maybe God put it in there or whatever. Uh, but once you start there, then you say, well, we can't enslave people. And if nothing else, the slavers know that the people they're enslaving don't want to be slaves because they have to chain them up and beat them and use weapons to keep them there or else they're going to run away. There's a crazy psychiatric disorder called drapetomania, which was the tendency for slaves to want to escape to freedom. This was a disease. <laughs> we have to eradicate this terrible disease. They want to be free. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, but yeah. isn't that not, okay, is that objective? Well, again, there's no outside source. I don't think God is doing anything because I don't think there is a God. But in our nature, it's, it's by our nature to want to be free, healthy, not suffer, and so on. Therefore, we should have values and structure society in a way to reduce suffering, to increase flourishing. But you're going from an is to an ought there. You, yeah, you, I know. You're saying, I know. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's well, do I it. just, I don't, <laughs> I, I just think that's, that's, um, I don't see why that inference is any more justified than, well, I'm from Liverpool, so I think Liverpool people should be more privileged, and I, I mean, I, I think any move from an is to an ought is just, I mean, I agree with Hume that much as an invalid inference. So I think if if we're gonna believe in value, we've got to have it in have it there from the start. You know, there's just I don't, and it's very weird and it's very mysterious. And I just sort of say this in the book. I mean, the one thing I do connect to to make it a bit more palatable is I think it's it's just as weird and mysterious as mathematical truth and mathematical knowledge. You know, with the seems to be I, most mathematicians are Platonists. They take themselves to be discovering these mathematical mm-hmm. truths especially pl- pl- post girdle with girdle's incompleteness theorem it's hard to uh, reduce maths to sort of trivial logic or something how, how can there be these where are they where are these facts about numbers and sets these eternal truths of yeah. and how do we know about them how do brains um what's his name uh, Roger Penrose got interesting mm. views on this. You know, he oh, right. talks about the mystery of the three realms, the empirical realm, the mind, and mathematical reality. How do these things connect up? So I, I do believe in, I don't believe the, the grounded in God, but I do believe there are somehow timeless truths of value. Um, how do we get, how, how do they exist? How do we get to know about them? Well, well the, it's, it's something like what we do with mathematics. However we do that, I've no idea. But Here's what I wrote in my essay called, Mr. Hume, tear down this wall. <laughs> so this is a uh, response to a critic of an earlier essay I wrote. He's a uh, professor, George Ellis is a physicist. So I said, oh, yeah. it is, okay, so you know him, yeah. So it is my hypothesis that in the same way that Galileo and Newton discovered physical laws and principles about the natural world that really are out there, so too have social scientists discovered moral laws and principles about human nature and society that really do exist. Just as it was inevitable that the astronomer Johannes Kepler would discover that planets have elliptical orbits, given that he was making accurate astronomical measurements, and given that planets really do travel in elliptical orbits, he could hardly have discovered anything else. Scientists studying political, economic, social, and moral subjects will discover certain things that are true in these fields of inquiry. For example, democracies are better than autocracies. Market economies are superior to command economies. And torture and the death penalty do not curb crime. That burning women as witches is a fallacious idea. That women are not too weak and emotional to run companies or countries. And most poignantly here, that blacks do not like being enslaved and Jews do not want to be exterminated. Why? Because it's in their human nature to want to survive and flourish, and it just starts there. So, in other words, I just start the causal mechanism there at human nature. What is it we want? Why should we care about what we want? Well, I want what I, I care about what I want. That's in my nature. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, so on a Dawkins type selfish gene model, uh, you know, I'm just going to grab all the resources I can and exploit you if possible. But in a game theory analysis that Dawkins also follows up, in which he says, don't read my book by the title (laughs) alone. (laughs) That is to say, I know that you have the same uh, exploitative tendencies, your little inner demons there, that I have. And I know that you know that I have the same ones, and I know that you know that I know, and so on. So in order for you and I to survive on the little desert island, I can't just exploit you. I have to treat you as a moral creature equivalent to me and i expect that in turn from you and if you don't then i'm going to punish moralistic punishment and all that to bring you into line anyway that's yeah okay so that's i mean yeah there's a practical justification to um but again i mean that doesn't answer the question of if you can get away with it if you if you know if you are some kind of dictator um uh, the, or, or even if in some kind of surreptitious, surreptitious way, I can in my job get away with things. 
um, you know, not I've got a lot of grading to do at the moment. Maybe I can just not read half of them and <laughs> no one will ever know. I'll just give them, you know, give them a, a B plus or whatever. I have no idea whatever. what you're talking about. Uh, I have never done that as a professor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would never do that to me. But, um, you know, then there's no argument. If it's all about this pragmatic, you know, how you get other people to do what you want of them, then as soon as you don't need people, then that, that argument falls away. Whereas I, I guess yeah, we think, right. Yeah. If you're okay. on a desert Island by yourself, yeah, there's no morality. Uh, but the moment you have a social primate species living in small groups and there's other groups and there's exploitation and so on, we have all that built into us. So the purpose of punishment uh, is mm. to several things to, in a utilitarian way, uh, change people's behaviors in the future. Also, uh, signaling to others, you know, I, I am not going to be exploited. I'm not going to put up with this. So we're going to bring the bullies into line here and the free riders. We're not going to let them get away with that. Christopher Baum has a whole book on this, Moral Origins, about his database of these hunter-gatherers, how they deal with free, free riders and bullies and so on. And they have this whole sequence of gossiping about them and scolding them and talking to them all the way up to capital punishment. You know, they take Og out for a, a hunt and they come back without Og. <laughs> they just off him. You know, if he's just really disruptive. And so, you know, we have these dual natures. It's in there. You will do things to get away with if you can get away with it. So that's why we have police and laws and or, or else, you know, this is Hobbes's thesis, right? This is it begins in a state of nature. You don't want to live in a state of nature. So it sounds to me like you're talking about law rather than morality. You're just talking about like pragmatic ways of running society rather than about what we should do or we ought to do or what rights we have. It's not about what rights we have. It's about, you know, how do we how do we run society so that... I guess it is a pragmatic you know. approach. I was just having this conversation yesterday with Dan Dennett for his new book, uh, uh, his oh, yeah. memoir. Oh, we, 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 about... we, <laughs> we interacted last week on... Um, oh. On, on our, we were on BBC Radio 3, Three Thinking program. It's going to be broadcast tomorrow, actually. By the time this comes out, it'll be out. And we were both yes. talking about our books. And we had a little bit of interaction on fine-tuning. And... Um, I suggested to Dan that it, he just couldn't handle it because it wasn't the picture of science he'd grown used to. And but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> oh I was boy. trying to play it, play him at his own game. You know, he's always he's always. So, <laughs> I, I think he's happy with that. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah, he did. He did mention that. Yeah, anyway, anyway, I loved his book. He's he's a longtime friend. In, yeah, me in, too. Uh, 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 But his art. W- one of his central arguments for free will is culpability, accountability. You can't have a civil, this isn't the only argument, but you can't have a civil society if you can't hold most people accountable. Now, of course, people with brain tumors and addictions or whatever, that a set aside. Maybe there's three to five percent that are just, you just got to lock them up. But everybody else under normal brain conditions, they will respond to punishments and rules and all. And we have to have that. Yeah, so... I'm on free will. I might be more with you, actually. Well, to the extent I'm a bit funny on free will, I suppose I am inclined to some kind of strong libertarian free will. And usually why people go for that is because of moral responsibility and so on. I'm not interested in that at all, though. I don't, I'm, not sh- I'm not sure I believe in real moral responsibility, you know, of the kind that would send you to heaven or hell, whether or not we have free will. Yeah, I tend to think moral responsibility is more about um, st- structuring society and deterrence and so on. So, yeah, I, 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 I guess I am inclined to believe in libertarian free will because I'm just so unconvinced by both the scientific and the philosophical arguments against. And, I mean, ultimately... You mean so, it's you're, an imper- so, yeah. so you're not a compatibilist and by libertarian no, no. free will... But you don't mean there's a little homunculus in there calling the shots. Well, no, that um, that some of our... So I'm somewhat agnostic on this, right? I'm not... It could turn out to be an illusion in a way that I don't... I mean, I'm much more passionate about the reality of consciousness. You know, the, the idea that pain could turn out to be an illusion is for the birds. But it could turn <laughs> out that we're not really free in the way we think we are. But... I don't think we know enough about the brain to know one way or the other. And until we do, I think it's, it's perfectly acceptable to believe, tentatively be, believe we are free in the way we think we are. And I think the way we think we are is that some of our decisions 
do not have prior causes, right? Um, let, I mean, I, I think it's perhaps comes out most obvious in a in a case of a, a moral dilemma, right? I want to. I have a strong desire to cheat on my partner, but let's say I I know in, I know rationally that it would be a terrible thing to do, not just a bad thing to do, but you know, it's I'll probably get caught out because I always do, and it'll destroy my marriage, and I'll be really unhappy. So I've got like. What I think I have, what I think I have most reason to do, and I've got this strong desire. I think it feels like um, it's up to us which we go, which we go for, and that seems to me a coherent possibility that it really is like that. I don't think we know anything about the brain that would rule it out. So for the mm. time being, I tentatively believe in it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I also, just it's not had, like uh, there's a soul. It's not like there's a soul or something. I don't okay. Think you have to all right. So you're it's not just, a dualist. No. You, you're not a dualist. No, but there's no, something just, floating around up there. It's just um, part of well, well, the, w one of the hypo. I don't know whether we need want to get into this at this point. Yeah. But one of the hypotheses I explore is this panagentialist view. Whether okay. so, yeah, you know, give it I've to us. Yeah. N known for defending panpsychism that consciousness goes down to the very building blocks of reality uh what i've been exploring in this one of the things i'm exploring in this book is that the roots of agency go down to the basic building blocks so that particles have a kind of proto agency and my reason for um tentatively exploring this i think i think really to my mind the biggest the biggest problem with libertarian free will is it does start to look dualistic it does start to look like human agency is very a very different kind of causation to what we find in the natural world where you know natural world it's sort of like things compelling other things to do stuff you know the billiard ball hits another and well that's just a toy version things compel other things whereas suddenly in the human case or maybe higher animals it's up to us we're not compelled at least in certain cases so i've defended this panagentialist view where uh, and i i suggest it's coherent empirically possible that actually all of nature has this kind of proto agency and so human libertarian free will if there is such a thing is not some magical supernatural thing that pops up when the when god puts a soul in the fetus it's just a highly evolved form of what exists more generally and throughout the universe so this is a derivative of your panpsychism that consciousness exists would you say separate from the physical stuff, like consciousness without neurons firing, or do you need you need the neurons firing? Well, I think particles are conscious, or I mean, or fields. It's controversial. It's up to it's a question for physics. What are the basic building blocks? Could be particles, could be fields, but whatever is at the base for the panpsychist has some very rudimentary form of experience. Nobody's saying particles have the consciousness of a human being, right? What it's like to be a human being is very rich and complex. What it's like to be a sheep is significantly simpler. What it's like to be a snail, simpler still. And as we move to, you know, simpler and simpler forms of life, we find simpler and simpler forms of experience. For the panpsychist, this keeps going down to the very basic building blocks of reality. Um, and then human, yeah. That's the, that's the basic idea. Right, but, right. I could see that part of the way down anyway, all the way to, say, single cells that are moving in an aqueous medium following a chemical gradient where they replenish their mitochondria or whatever they're doing. You know, they're responding in interaction with an environment in order to do something, to consume energy, to keep going and reproduce or whatever. Even viruses, in a way, do that. Uh, and they're not really technically alive. But once you move to inanimate, I, I don't see that happening. You know, the glass, what's it like to be the glass? Well, the glass isn't interacting with the environment in any way. It's just sitting there. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, the thing about consciousness is it's not a publicly observable phenomenon. So, you, yeah, you, I can't look inside your brain and see your feelings and experiences. This is why consciousness science is such a mess at the moment. <laughs> Uh, and you can't look in the electron to see whether it has thoughts or feelings. You know, it doesn't have thoughts. I don't know why I said that. Um, <laughs> so we have to decide on more theoretical grounds. I mean, the way I tend to put it now is, I mean, what look, what I'm so so passionate about about consciousness 
I've just been, I've just got back from the US debating Sean Carroll on this, that video that's just gone on YouTube. Um, it, this is not a purely scientific issue. At the core here is an ancient philosophical problem known as the mind-body problem. The challenge of how consciousness and the physical world fit together. And there are various options. Maybe it's the physical world that's first and consciousness emerges from processes in the brain. Or maybe it's the other way around, as the panpsychist thinks. Maybe it's consciousness that's first and physical reality emerges from underlying facts about consciousness. That's, that's my own preferred view. Or maybe they're both fundamental, as the dualist thinks. Both matter and consciousness are, di are radically different, but both fundamental. Now, each of these views, the reason this isn't a scientific question is each of these views is empirically equivalent, right? Whatever scientific data you come up with, each view just interprets that data on its own terms, right? So you're not going to decide in terms of an experiment. So how are you going to decide? I think you just have to try and evaluate each, op each option in terms of, for example, its explanatory obligations. Like we want, we want materialism. If you're going to start with the, with, the, with the physical world and try and get consciousness out, you want to ask, how well have you done with that? And despite decades of um, serious effort and time being put into that, I would argue it's got precisely nowhere. The hard problem of consciousness has not softened one iota. And I think there's pretty good reasons to think it's just not a coherent project. Whereas in terms of the panpsychist approach, the panpsychist explanatory project of starting with consciousness and trying to explain the emergence of physical reality from underlying facts about consciousness, we've already worked out how to do that. The mysteries are solved. And so we've got two explanatory projects here. One materialism, never gone anywhere, of dubious coherence. One panpsychism, mysteries are all solved. We've worked, we've worked out how to do it. It feels a bit weird for modern Westerners, but so it's, it's, it's a no-brainer in my view. Anyway, sorry, that's my, I'm still in debate mode. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. No, no, I, I, uh, you sent me that link, so I watched the debate last night with you and Sean Carroll. Oh, um, yeah. I, oh, I, 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 I better versions just come out, actually. The, the, but anyway. Well, the, what, whatever, it's the Marist, right? At Marist. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. a, a better, a properly, more properly, professionally filmed version was just released. But oh, anyway, I you see. probably no, saw yeah, it. I, I but, thought yeah. it was, I, I just it listened was, to it mostly. Um, but I thought the two of you hit bedrock or say an epistemological wall where there was nowhere else to go. You know, he kept saying, here's the laws of physics, quantum physics and whatnot, the Higgs boson and so forth. Where, where, what do you add to that? And at some point you just, you're both kind of just like, well, here we are, we're at the bottom. And, and you know, yeah. this, this, you know, there's nowhere deeper to go. I also think there's certain, uh, I'm almost a Mysterian uh, mysteries person, maybe it's not soluble, like the free will determinism. Well, what do you mean by free? You know, if it's true, libertarian free will, then the universe is not determined, but the universe is determined, except for those quantum indeterminacy effects, but that doesn't give you free will. And yet I still feel free. Why? Because I could have done otherwise. You know, so people like uh, Robert Sapolsky and Sam Harris make these arguments about, you know, rerunning the tape and you would do the same thing you could not have done differently but i i make a, a a different argument that that if you the universe is never going to repeat itself exactly uh as it was in the past you're part of the causal net you're in there and you're learning from your past experiences so my thought experiment uh, so let me read this to you you'll get a kick out of this um so here's sam harris's definition of a determinism. Our wills are simply not of our own making. Thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we are unaware and over which we exert no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. And then I just had Robert Sapolsky on the show. His book is called Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. It comes out, I think, in a couple of weeks. Highly recommended. He says we are nothing more or less than the cumulative biological and environmental luck over which we have no control and has been brought to us at any moment. Okay, so <laughs> my thought experiment here is that um, let's say either of those two people, or just say John Doe and is married to Jane Doe, and they're happily married. He would never cheat on her, but, you know, he's human. Things happen. He's on the road. He's at a conference. One thing leads to another, and, you know, his wife finds out. 
you know, does he say to her, well, honey, <laughs> I simply do not have to, uh, I am nothing more or less than the cumulative biological environmental luck over which I had no control or darling, our wills are not, my will is not of my making thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which I'm unaware. I simply do not have the freedom you think I have, you know, could they even finish the sentence with before bam, you know, you got slapped across the face. You better damn well never do that again. Okay. So according to them, they would do it again, but I'm arguing that, but you would not find yourself in the exact same conditions with the same atoms and molecules in your body and so on and so forth. You would have had already had the experience, the slap across the face. And if you do this again, I'm taking the kids and leaving you. Uh, you're going to go, okay, I am not going to have that extra drink. I'm not going to let myself be alone with this one. Or I'm not going to go to the hotel room with her, you know, whatever it is, uh, to avoid that. So you, you do do different. You do have some control, even if the universe is determined, you're part of the determining universe. Anyway, that's my, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I read Sam Harris's little book on free will and gives the impression that Nobody believes in libertarian free will anymore. We know that's a load of nonsense. But I mean, I know you know, Michael, the, uh, the Phil Papers survey of philosophers' oh, yeah, yeah, opinions yeah. on things. And actually, right. Sam Harris's view is even more unpopular <laughs> than, than yes, libertarian yes. free will. Yes, I mean, yeah. But they're both pretty unpopular. Compatibilism is by far the, the dominant yeah. position. But I just think, I think it's a kind of dogma, actually, that I just think we don't know enough about the brain. Um, I, you know, the... The more I talk to neuroscientists, and a great book I, that really changed my mind on this was uh, Matthew Cobb's book, The Idea of yes, the Brain. Yes. And Matthew, is, is, Matthew Cobb does, does not like my, agree with me philosophically at all, but okay. just revealing how little we know about the workings of the brain. We, we know a lot of, about the basic chemistry, you know, how neurons fire, how neurotransmitters send signals. We know a fair bit about what big bits of the brain do in the sort of functional economy, but we're almost clueless on how those functions are realized at the cellular level. And until we, until we know much more about how the brain works, we've just got no idea whether there's kind of libertarian free will or not. We just don't know. And so... While, while we don't know empirically, I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, well, until I have evidence to the contrary, I'm going to believe in it tentatively. But, you know, ultimately, it's an empirical question. Of all people, I heard Chomsky make an argument like that the other day on a podcast mm. where basically on free will determinism, he says, nobody, not even determinists, actually believe in, in determinism. That when they walk around the world, they absolutely 100% act like they're free and making free choices. Of course. He said, so what, what's the point of even talking about it? It's an interesting take. And He's this, always this, interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Chomsky's great. I interviewed him on our podcast and um, Mind Chat, quick plug for my podcast. But um, I think he's, yeah, please. he's just incredible that he's, he knew so much about our stuff on philosophy of consciousness. How would you, no, you know, it's like not his kind of area of speciality at all. But so um, it, it could be free uh, will is a, use, a useful fiction. It's one of these things where you can't, prove it one way or the other. So it, it's sort of a pragmatic truth. Um, if it works for you and it doesn't make any difference otherwise, then why not believe in it? You know, and, and some, for some people, uh, God is like that. It, it's like, you can't prove there is no God. You know, Martin Gardner, the great skeptic and one of the founders of the modern skeptical movement, you know, he had the scientific American column before I did. Um, you know, he used to, he says, I'm a fideist after, um, um, you know, kind of pragma pragmatism, Miguel in a new, Unamuno and uh, William James, and that in certain uh, questions that cannot be resolved, uh, either science has not resolved them, or it may be even in principle, you know, God, the afterlife, and free will, that it's okay to go ahead and just act whatever works for you. So for him, Martin, he said, uh, I believe in God. I think the atheists have slightly better arguments than the theists, but like you, have, you were telling your story, but the theist arguments are not terrible. They're pretty good arguments. So why not? What difference does it make to you whether I believe in God or not? I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just saying this is what I believe. I believe in prayer, the afterlife. I'm going to see my beloved wife in the next life. I know I can't. I'm not endorsing Uri Geller psychics or talking to the dead or any of that nonsense. 
I'm just saying for me, this is what's true. And maybe free will is one of those. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with William James. He had a great paper, uh, the, the, the Will to Believe. He, he, he said in a footnote he wished he'd called it the right to believe, actually, mm. rather than the will to believe. That it's acceptable in the absence of evidence. So I think, yeah, I mean, an analogy I like to give sometimes is, um, you know, if, you, if you've got a... Oh, you think about climate change. You know, if, like, if you just look at the evidence, it doesn't look likely, maybe, that we're going to be able to deal with this <laughs> catastrophic problem. But it can still be rational to live in hope that we're going to deal with it. Or if you've got a friend dying, you know, and there's a 30% chance they're going to make it, it can be rational to sort of have faith that they're going to make it. Say, I believe you. I think you're going to pull through. And you're not necessarily yeah. deluding yourself. You know the probability, but you're choosing to live in hope that they're going to pull through. And I mean, there's got to be limits to this, right? If there's, I don't think you should have faith that, you know, aliens are going to rescue us from climate change or something. <laughs> if something's so improbable or if your friend is, you know, the doctors say, look, there's a 99.99 chance they're going to die, then you should be helping them to adjust to death. You know, you shouldn't be sort of creating false hopes. But, I mean, this comes up in the book, actually, because, so, I, I mean, I do think we are lucky enough to have reason to believe there is cosmic purpose or some kind of goal-directedness at the fundamental level of reality. Uh, I, th I sort of think, like, Dan, like I accused Dan Dennett of, I sort of think we're a bit in denial about it as a society because it's, it's not the picture of science we've got used to. It's a little bit like in the 16th century where... You know, we started to get evidence that we weren't in the center of the universe, and people struggled to accept that because it wasn't the picture of reality they'd got used to. And these days, we kind of scoff at those people and think, ah, oh, those stupid religious people, they couldn't follow the evidence. But I think every generation absorbs a worldview they can't see beyond. And I think it's a bit something similar going on with our reaction to fine tuning. I think we're just, we're not following. The pretty straightforward evidential implications of, of what is in plain sight. Um, but, I mean, maybe we should have a chat about fine-tuning. But, but just, you know, I don't know whether that, if there is a cosmic purpose, I don't know whether it's a good purpose or I have some role to play in it or whatever. So that's where William James comes in. I think to an extent, it can be rational to hope beyond the evidence. But yeah, but I think we're, very, we're living in very lucky times because we do have pretty strong empirical evidence that there is some kind of co cosmic goal directedness on the basis of the fine tuning. Okay. Let's come back to that one second. One, one last point on the uh, consciousness and what it's like to be something. So, you know, I just paste Thomas Nagel. What's it like to be a dolphin? Well, okay. I could put on big fins. I go out in the ocean, flip flap around. Maybe I, I hook up some, you know, acoustic stuff that p sends out pings and I have, bolt on some big ears to see what it feels like to have that come back and so on. But I'm, I'm just approximating it. If I actually bolted in the neural networks and so on and redesign my body to be a more fusiform body to slip through the water better than a human body can. And so on, at some point I would just be a dolphin, not a human wondering what it's like to be a dolphin. In fact, is it, would this not, I'm not a philosopher, would this not violate um, Aristotle's law of identity? A is A, A cannot be not A. I can't be a human in a dolphin. This is kind of a dualistic idea that my little homunculus can go over into your skull to see if the red looks like to you what it looks like to me, because that's just dualism. There's no ghost in the machine that does that. I can't be know what it's like to be a dolphin. And so to your discussion of the philosophical zombie, I, I don't even know for sure that you're sentient <laughs> and feeling what I'm feeling, but here I apply the Copernican principle, we're not special, to myself, I'm not special. I'm just a regular person. My neurons probably work the same as yours. If I see you nodding or smiling or feeling sad or whatever, it's a pretty good bet. Not 100%, but good bet. You, you're feeling, you have an internal uh, sense of, of emotions and so on, similar to me, because we're products of evolution and so on. Is that not a reasonable assumption? And and is, is the, Absolutely. okay, the hard, the hard problem is the problem that the next step from that, they're, you know, figuring out the circuitry and why it produces what it does. So the next step is, what is it like to be the circuitry? That's an unanswerable question from science. Anyway, that's just riff on that. 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a with with Nagel, it's a little bit obscure what what he's trying to do with it, but I think one way of seeing what's going on here with the heart problem and everything, yeah, of course I'm never going to be able to be you, know what it's like to be you, but if physicalism is true, then the fundamental story we get from physics is everything. That is all the information. Um, okay, you might have to have super incredible rational faculties to sort of work out all the facts about the world from the particles in the fields. But for a physicalist like Sean Carroll or whoever, in principle, that is the full story. That is really everything that's going on. And everything else is just different ways of describing what's going on at the level of physics. But the point Nagel and Chalmers and Frank Jackson and me are getting at is, no, there's information. There's information about reality that you're never going to get from that story. The information about the, the character of a red experience, right? A, a colorblind neuroscientist, a colorblind scientist who knows all the particles and physics, all the f- particles and fields, all the physics, they no matter how super duper the rational capabilities are, they're never going to be able to deduce from that what it's like to see red, the qualitative character of a red experience. And that shows that there is information, information about reality that can't be got out of that story. And so must be something extra to that story or, or for a panpsychist, something underneath that story. Well, that's let's see, the idea. See, it, yeah, so Sean answered your challenge there by saying, if we manipulated, was it Mary? Is it Mary, the, the neuroscientist that knew, right, lived no. in a black and white world? Well, if we manipulated her brain, I think what he was getting at there, if we gave her some hallucinogens or we, we, we entered her brain, visual cortex, and stimulated the portion of the visual cortex that sees red, she would see red. Yeah, that, that, that's right. She would experience it. But again, that's a, a different question from look, looking at it, the system, the circuitry from the outside, to actually experiencing the circuitry operating. That can only be an internal personal state ever. Yeah, but so I I would say that's a false dichotomy. So is is the question, um, does changing her brain give her the experience? Yes, of course. We all agree on that. Nobody disputes the the, the experiences you have are dependent on the structure of your brain. The the physicalist, the panpsychist, the dualist all accept that. That's just neutral scientific data. Okay. Uh, But the question is, we want an explanation. Why? Why does that kind of brain activity produce an experience with that kind of reddish character? I think we want an explanation of the kind we've managed to get in chemistry. For example, w- liquidity. Think about liquidity. Why does liquid sort of flow? You know enough about the chemistry. That's in- you have an intelligible explanation of why liquidity emerges or the boiling point of water, why that emerges from the underlying chemistry, we can make that emergence intelligible. Likewise, if physicalism is true, um, you ought to be able to make intelligible how experience with a red character emerges from patterns of neural firings. Not just that it does. We all agree that it does. This is what I got stuck on with Joe Rogan. Uh, I can seem to get, this is what we're aged. It's not just, we all agree that it does. But why make intelligible the emergence? Uh, and so it's neither. It's not just, oh, I can't get in your head. And it's not denying that it does. But why? We want an explanation. Mm. And that is mm. what the physicalist has manifestly failed to give any yeah, ounce of right. for decades and decades. Okay. And, the, and the Mary and Bat arguments and so on, I think, give us good reasons to think it's just not a coherent project that we're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, okay, here. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Well, so either uh, we're just not there yet. The science isn't fully developed. I think this is what Sean said. But you'll hear this from like Christoph Koch. I see he paid um, David Chalmers a, a, a case of wine for the, the bet that in 25 years we would have it, it resolved. Okay. Are you saying that you, give, you can give it another 25 years or 2,500 years? They're never going to solve it because they're, they're going down the wrong track. Was this not Galileo's error? That this kind of science isn't going to answer that kind of problem. Yeah, so the, the task of the science of consciousness is to work out what we call the neural correlates of consciousness, which kinds of brain activity 
go along with which kinds of experience, and more generally, which kinds of physical activity go along with any consciousness at the biological level. Um, and it's, it's that scientific task that is all a mess at the moment. And I just wrote something for the conversation on, on the big scandal in integrated information theory. Is it pseudoscience? Is it not? And so on. Uh, oh, I didn't that's know there just, was a scandal. What's the scandal? Oh, you haven't heard that. All no. right. Over, over 100 researchers signed a public letter saying integrated information theory was pseudoscience. Uh, oh, Co oh my. Which is Cox's view. And lots of people <laughs> on the other side responded saying this is poorly reasoned and disproportionate. And um, yeah, so, so I, I, I wrote a piece. I'm sort of in the middle of this, but I wrote a piece saying, well, we need to we need to think about both the science and philosophy if we're dealing with consciousness, and this is part of the reason we're not making progress. But um, but yeah, so so I hope I hope science will be able to close in on that problem. But I don't think just doing scientific experiments will ever give us an answer to why, because it it but, it just but... always leaves open these different philosophical options. Well, um, this this is the error, right? That that science is not in the business of answering why questions. Yeah, um, I guess not all. Maybe that's not general. Depends, well, evolutionary the theorists theory. answer. Well, they kind of answer. You know, why does sex feel good? Why does fruit taste sweet? But they're just re really looking for an ultimate natural selection argument, not why cosmically. Yeah. So look, science. How how do we do brain? How do we do science of consciousness? You can't observe consciousness directly, but if you're dealing with a human being, you can ask them. And if you do that while you're scanning their brain, or you can look for external marks of consciousness and you try and match them up. Um, okay, that kind of data is, is never going to give you an explanation of why right. these things are correlated. Right. You're just going to get to the fact that it is. So you've got to, then, you've, then you turn to the philosophy. You say, well, is it that, so why do consciousness, so we know scientifically that consciousness and the physical world are correlated in a quite complicated way. But why are they correlated? Is it because the physical world is fundamental and consciousness pops out of that? Or is it because consciousness is fundamental and the physical world pops out of that? Or is it because they're both fundamental? And we just have to assess these options. And I think, as I say, the physicalist option has never made any progress. Uh, whereas the panpsychist option, we've sort of solved all the mysteries. So, so I'm repeating myself a little bit now. But yeah, I think it's it's not it's not an experimental question. It's a it's right. it's a philosophical question. That's well, that's what I yeah. Think. This is this is what uh, yeah Deepak Chopra tells me. You know, consciousness is the the ground of all being. You can't get underneath it, and that physical stuff comes out of consciousness. You know, Donald Hoffman. I don't know if you read his book on his interface. Yes. What is it? Interface theory of perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what are your thoughts on his? Um, do I want to summarize it or, yeah? Uh, we we had we had Donald Hoffman on my uh, on on my on podcast recently. And, okay. Oh, um, okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So I do. I mean, I do the podcast with a guy who has the total opposite opinion to me. You know, he doesn't think oh. consciousness exists in in a certain sense, at least. And so I think consciousness is everywhere. He thinks it it doesn't exist at all. But um, <laughs> so we had our different takes on. I mean, I think so. Look, Do Hoffman has a very similar view to me. Yeah. So, you know, we're sort of in the and it's, you know, it's really cool and interesting what he what he does. But I, I suppose I have a little a couple of worries with the way he gets the uh, I mean, one worry is that a, a number of philosophers have had is there's a worry. It's kind of self-defeating because so Hoffman's argument is, well, because we evolved. We shouldn't trust our senses because our senses evolved to get us survival, rob, fitness rather than truth. Right. OK. Mm. But if you can't trust your senses to tell you about reality, how do you know we evolved? <laughs> it, <laughs> right. you, you only know we yes, evolved because right. you bloody look at fossils or whatever. So there's a worry itself undermining. And we mm -hmm. went back and forth on this. And I did get him to say at one point, well, I don't believe in evolution. <laughs> but, but He said that? I, I, he really? did. That is a direct oh quote. God. But I, I oh think he God. wants to. I, but, but let me let me qualify that. I think he. There's something nuanced by that, in in the sense that there's a deeper story or something. Okay, all right. Not I think a, he's not saying a all, all, thing. all no, 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 no. Like yeah. all scientific explanations break down or something like that. Hmm. But I don't know. I think I think we do need evolution to explain, you know, where where complex yeah, life forms so it, come from. And I don't I don't think we can just give it up without something to replace it. His theory just talks about 
networks of conscious agents and but it doesn't I don't think that's sufficient to yeah. explain the emergence of evolved conscious life. So that's that's one worry. What's my other worry? Um uh, da, 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 da. Oh, just this well, I think there's there's a worry that he conflates like so he appeals to this st- stuff from physics that um space and time don't exist. Space and time yes, are doomed. Yes, right. But I mean and Sean Carroll's also said this. The, the worry, well, it's well, he said this at the conference because this was part of a panpsychist conference that mm. Kat, Sean, and I debated at, and Hoffman was doing one of the talks. And oh. Sean's point was, okay, just because consciousness doesn't exist, sorry, forget consciousness. Just because space and time don't exist at the fundamental level, it doesn't mean they don't exist at all, right? They're mm. just most physicists who think space time are not fundamental. They think they're emergent, so they're perfectly real. They're just yeah. so they're the, they're the two worries I have about, but you know Donald's a really interesting thinker and, and a good friend and um, he blurred my book. <laughs> that's not the reason. <laughs> yeah. I'm, that's not the reason I'm returning these compliments. He's you know he's a really interesting thinker. But well, I, I suppose like it too. I, I, I had him I'm on the show and I've I interacted with him at Deepak's conference on uh, consciousness. Yeah. So, but my my take beef up with it is that okay. So he talks. He and Deepak talk about species specific perceptions. So. You know, this this thing here, my phone, or just take the cup, for example, to a bat is going to look very different on its equivalent of a visual cortex than it does mine. So its icon, in, in, in Hoffman's theory, you know, the icons are different. And so, yeah, that that's true. But there really is a cup there. And if the bat is flying toward it, it's going to really move around it because it's really there. And so, you know, it, it's although uh, perceptions didn't evolve for veridical, you know, perfection, of reality, it's it's you know it's good enough to survive and flourish and get your genes in the next generation. You have to have some idea of what's going on, and so to the dolphin, the shark's going to look very different than it does to me, and it has a different icon in its brain. But there really is a shark, and really has sharp things at one end and a tail at the other end, and it really wants to eat you. And so you really should take the intentional stance that that's an agent that has bad intentions, and I'm going to avoid it, and I can avoid it by doing certain things that you know flapping my tail. And those are true because there really is a reality. It's really there. And if it wasn't, then mimicry wouldn't work, right? I mean, snakes that are not poisonous look like snakes that are poisonous. Why would that be? Because their predators and prey and so on perceive that to be what the real snake looks like because it's really poisonous. So the mimicry snake looks like it. And, and that works because of this reality that's really there. Yeah, I think I might, I think I might agree with you on this. Um... So the, I mean, Hoffman's view is what philosophers would generally call idealism. I think that um, that the physical world is somehow an illusion, or ultimately there's just facts about consciousness. Whereas the the panpsychist view I adopt is maybe a little bit closer to the physicalist. In that, you know, yeah, I think there's a real physical world out there. There's a cup here, the light bouncing off and stuff. It's just that. The physical world is made up of little conscious things, you know, or maybe big fieldy, field like conscious things or whatever. But um it's it's you know, as Stephen Hawking said, you know, physics doesn't tell us what breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe. So for the panpsychist, it's consciousness that breathes fire into the equations. But the physics physical world is really out there as physics describes it, and you know, I enjoy trying to follow what physicists are working out on that, but it's just that there's a deeper story. Okay, let's look at the fine-tuning argument. Okay, here's my response to the fine-tuning argument. The argument being that uh, the universe is a, a certain way, and if it was not this way, it's not that, that we wouldn't be here. There couldn't be matter and you know just any kind of structure, stars, planets, life forms, and so on. Okay, uh, so here's my argument against it. First, the universe is not so finely tuned for life. The vast majority of the universe is empty space, and the vast majority of what little matter there is is completely inhospitable to life, including most planets. In its 13.8 billion year history, the anthropic conditions for life were non-existent. It's only during this narrow slice of time that the universe is finally tuned for life. Physicists John Barrow and John Webb also note that the so-called constants of nature, the speed of light, gravitation, the mass of the electron, and so on, may be inconstant, varying over time from the Big Bang to the present, making the universe finely tuned only right now. Anyway, I go on and on about this. We're not finally, it's not finely tuned for us. We're finely tuned for, for it and, and so on. 
But the, the biggest one to me was that a physicist who say, we just don't know enough now. Until we have a unified theory between gravity and quantum physics, we just don't know what's behind the fine tuning. There may be one equation that explains the six, you know, the six fine tune arguments that Martin Rees wrote a whole book about. There might be one thing that ties them all together. We just don't know. And so why why go the anthropic route that, you know, there's a tuner that designed it and just say, we don't know? I'm not sure I, I, I disagree with that, really. That Well, look, I mean, you're right. Physics hasn't finished yet. We haven't worked out how to put together uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. Maybe when we do that, the fine tuning will go away. Or maybe, but maybe, equally maybe, there'll be more <laughs> fine tuning. You know, <laughs> yeah. so all, look, all we can ever do is work with the evidence we have right now. And to my mind, the evidence we have right now suggests some kind of cosmic goal directedness towards life. We should be tentative to the extent that we don't know the evidence might change tomorrow, sure. But I sometimes think I, there seems to be a little bit of a double standard often, you know, like people will say, you know, oh, yeah, we, we, we can't decide about fine tuning yet, you know, because we don't know. But, you know, they're quite happy to say lots of things we're confident about, you know, from our best <laughs> guess at what the universe is like. So it seems like when it comes to the pretty straightforward implications, it's, I shouldn't say straightforward. It's, you know, there's debatable points here, but what on the face of it seem to be the evidential implications of fine tuning on just a straightforward Bayesian way of thinking about things. Uh, people say, ramp up. People are sort of ramping up the standards of evidence. No, we, we want to finish physics before we can say, you know, so no, look, all we can do is have our best guess based on, you know, I, I mean, I think before fine tuning, our best guess should have been, um, the universe looks pretty meaningless and purposeless. Now, if a religious believer came to you and said, well, no, we can't decide that till physics is finished. You know, we'd say, no, look, <laughs> we've got to go what the evidence we have right now. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that, that, we just, that's all we can ever do. So, okay, let's cash out the thesis of your book. What is the purpose of the universe? Is it this directionality toward consciousness and us, or is it something similar to that? Good question. What's the purpose? Yeah, people have to buy the book to find yeah, out. To find out. You got to get to the last chapter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, well, I don't think we know. I think it's, so I think it's from the evidence of fine tuning and there's stuff to do with consciousness. I think, I think there's ever some kind of goal directedness towards the emergence of life, intelligent life, conscious understanding of the world around us. Um, it could be. That's that's it, right? It could be, you know, that's all, folks. That's the end. But, you know, it seems somewhat improbable that if, if, if there is cosmic purpose that were the sort of final end point, it seems more likely that it's still unfolding in ways we don't yet understand and that there will emerge some greater form of existence that will make, you know, our existence look like what... Ah, sorry, I've lost my train of thought then. <laughs> greater than us, great, some purpose greater than us as our existence is unfathomable and so yeah. much greater than that of worms. You know, so, so yeah, so I think there's, there's reason to take seriously a sort of goal-directedness looking historically. Where it will go from here, who knows? And, I, and as I said, to some extent, I think we can follow um, William James in hoping beyond the evidence uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, who knows? So, um, one branch of intelligent design theorists, as they like to be called, not creationists, is that God does not intervene in the universe. He's not controlling the fall of every sparrow and so forth. And so, okay, then where did all this complexity come from? Well, they, they argue that, and this is the term they use, the laws of nature are front loaded with this future design that's going to emerge from the laws as they are designed. And that's where the designer comes in. It's almost a deist argument. You know, you just, God, just start the whole thing off and running and, you know, in 15 billion years, you're going to get sentient beings. 13.7 I mean, billion years, <laughs> you're going to get sentient beings, something like that. Is that feasible in your model of panpsychism without a personal God being involved at all? Just front-loaded laws. So this is the challenge 
I think we need to explain both the things that seem to suggest some kind of purpose, like fine-tuning certain facts about the evolution of consciousness that we maybe haven't got into. Uh, but we also need to explain the things that are arbitrary and gratuitous, the things you mentioned, you know, that so much of the universe is empty and pointless. We need a hypothesis that explains both of these. Uh, you know, and in the book, I don't settle on a, a single view. I consider a, a range of hypotheses from a sort of non-standard designer, maybe a bad god or an amoral god or, or the, a god of limited abilities who's made the best universe she can or, or the simulation hypothesis, you know? Maybe we're in a computer simulation constructed by some random computer programmer in the next universe up. Um, so that's one possibility. Also, um, a, a possibility Thomas Nagel has also developed at length, teleological laws, sort of laws of nature with purposes built into them. So it's not obvious you, you need a conscious mind to lie behind cosmic purpose. Um, so these teleological laws might interact with the laws of physics, the more familiar laws of physics in ways we don't yet understand, leading to this strange mix of accident and design. Or finally, the hypothesis I think is probably a little bit better on balance um, and connects more with my previous work on panpsychism. Cosmopsychism, so that the universe itself is a conscious mind with its own goals. But uh, your question, I think I'll, I've lost your question. And it, de is it kind of deistic? Yeah, I suppose. I, I mean, I definitely don't have the idea of some kind of constantly intervening cosmic force, whether, whether it's a non-standard designer or the conscious universe or impersonal tendency to the good. Because our universe is pretty shit in lots of ways, you know. And so it does, there's not a lot of constant intervention going on. Although I do say that the fine-tuning and this panagentialist view seem to interact in fortuitous ways that, um, uh, well, maybe we don't want to get into the weeds here, but, but I, I think you need both of these things to get the evolution of consciousness. So I think without fine-tuning, uh, as, as many scientists have argued, I don't think you'd have structural complexity, so we wouldn't get complex living organisms. But without some kind of panpsychist, panagentialist view, I think we would have all been zombies. We would have all um, evolved as sort of complex survival mechanisms that can interact with the environment in all sorts of survival conducive ways, but have no kind of inner life or experience at all. Because natural selection just cares about behavior, right? It doesn't care about the quality of your inner life. So we need both panagentialism and the fine tuning working together to get the emergence of creatures with conscious understanding of the reality around them and the ability to respond on that basis. Uh, so maybe that does suggest a kind of, in some sense, a sort of preloaded setup, I guess. Yeah, I guess that might be a good way to describe it, in fact. And then, you know, the cosmolo one cosmologist answer to that is the multiverse. You know, maybe there's 500 trillion bubble universes, all of with slightly different laws of nature. And we're, we just happen to be in one of those where the laws of nature are that the way they are, and here we are. Um, but I don't see any way to test the difference between that and that and what we just talked about. Some, some sort of designer that preloaded pre the laws of nature, and here we are. And maybe we've then there, at that point, hit epis the epistemological wall. We just can't go any further. I mean, I used to go for the multiverse myself. But I've I've always thought the fine tuning needed explaining. Yeah. Uh, but I I thought multiverse was the best explanation. I don't like, you know, defending cosmic purpose. I feel kind of silly. You know. You do. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it, well, it's you know, I think that's how these things work, isn't it? It's this is this is I'm go. You know, it doesn't fit with mm. the respectable view of science that we've got used to. Um, I like to I quote in the book, you know, with the great economist Keynes when a journalist said to him. You didn't used to think that. And Keynes said, well, when the facts change, I changed my views. What do you do, sir? And, <laughs> right. you know, I, I, that's very hard for human beings to do. I think we've got use. I think for over 100 years after Darwin, there was this science, was this story of mean, meaningless, purposeless universe. And that got absorbed into the culture, you know, that science has ruled all that out. And then the evidence changes. It's hard for the 
culture to catch up with it. But anyway, the multiverse, I used to believe, but I was persuaded over a long period of time, partly through teaching philosophy of religion and getting into the weeds, that I was persuaded by experts on probability that there's just a flawed inference in um, some flawed reasoning in the inference from fine tuning to a multiverse. Mm. Um, and, and this is what I'm really exci- one of the things I'm excited about this book, actually, because this has been in the philosophy journals for decades. But in a typical example of philosophers talking to themselves, nobody knows about it. So I, I'm, 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 I'm quite excited to get this out to a broader audience. And I think I'm the first person to connect it up with the science. And anyway, I, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a long, complicated debate here. But let me just give you an analogy to try yeah. and make the point. So this is the charge is that the multiverse theorist commits what's called the inverse gambler's fallacy. OK, so suppose uh, you and I, Michael, go into a casino and... The first thing we see is some guy having an incredible run of luck, right? He's just r- winning and winning, rolling, double six, double six, winning, winning. And I say, oh, my God, the casino must be very full tonight. And you say, what? What are you talking about? We've just seen this one guy. How do you know what's going on in the rest of the casino? And I say, well, if there's a very large number of people playing in the casino, then it's not so surprising that someone's going to win big. And that's what we've seen. We've just observed someone in the casino winning big. Now, everyone agrees that's a fallacy. This is the inverse gambler's fallacy because our evidence, our observational evidence is, is just this, is, this what, is that this particular person has won big. And no matter how many people there are or are not elsewhere in the casino has no bearing on the likelihood of this person, this particular person winning big. That looks exa- indiscernible from the reasoning of the, of the multiverse theorist and explaining fine-tuning, at least in terms of multiverse, right? You start think, oh my God, the right numbers have come up in our physics. How improbable. There must be loads of other universes. But all, you know, our observational evidence is this universe being fine-tuned and the existence of other universes has no probabilistic bearing on how likely it is that this universe, which is our evidence, gets to be fine-tuned. So there are lots of complicated stories. What about the interaction with the scientific case with inflationary cosmology and the anthropic principle and so on? But I was dragged kicking and screaming over about two years to think that this is just, that there is just very dodgy reasoning going on in the physics community here. And it's just not an option. So I was forced to accept cosmic purpose and I still feel a bit silly, but I've got to follow the evidence where it leads. I I wound people up on Twitter saying, Bertrand Russell would have believed in cosmic purpose on the basis of fine tuning because <laughs> he followed the evidence where it led. There just okay. wasn't the evidence. What is the around. what is the cosmic purpose? And, and and let's just bring it home for the average listener that doesn't give much thought to any of this. Like, I gotta go to work tomorrow, drop my kids off at school, and keep food in the fridge and gas in the gas tank. What is my purpose? So the cl- the claim is so. Look, most of this book is just building an argument that we have scientific and philosophical reason to think there is cosmic purpose. There is some fundamental drive towards the good in the cosmos. There just is. Now, you could read, uh, how many chapters are in this book? Six of the seven chapters and say, yeah, I agree with all that. I might, my colleague, David Faraci, actually, is a moral philosopher. He says, yeah, I think it's a good argument. I don't give a shit, though, if there's cosmic purpose. It's nothing to do with the meaning in my life. And that's perfectly fine. Um, And to be clear, I do think you can have a meaningful life totally independent of whether the universe has a meaning. And maybe it's something to do with temperament as well. But if, if there is, I mean, this comes back to where we started, I suppose, if there is a greater purpose to the whole of reality. And if, and this is a big if, and this is to some extent hoping beyond the evidence, but if we can in some small way, through the little good things we do, contribute to the aims of the whole of reality, that is, wow, that is what a meaningful life that is. I think that's a more meaningful life. So I think I've come to think that, come to find what I sometimes call cosmic purposivism, sort of living in hope of there being a greater purpose that you can contribute to. 
not some externally imposed from a God figure, but just perhaps a natural tendency in the universe. Living in hope of that can be a, a deeply meaningful way to live. And, you know, who knows? You know, these things are very uncertain. As you see, the evidence might change tomorrow, but you only live once and you've got to work out how you're going to live your life. And I find that to be a meaningful way of living your life. It keeps my ego. I confessed earlier, I've got a little bit of ego. It keeps that in check to sort of try and connect myself to some broader thing going on here than just my own personal interests. And um, yeah, give it a go. Like, that's the, that's like, the aim of the book, I guess. I like that. No, I love the book. It was great. It reminds me of I had two other guests, Clay Routledge, who studies meaning and purpose in life, the psychology of it. And then I just had Dacker Keltner on the show. His book is called Awe. I really recommend this book because in, in a way, what he's recommending, what, what they find that people do to kind of find spirituality or awe, whatever the right word is, is kind of what um, I suppose you might think of finding, a, what did you call it, agents, agency, a, agentic? What was the term? Panagentialism. Panagentalism. Pan you talk sure about in the book about, about, well, I like it. Um, you know, trees have a certain aw awareness of their environment. And so on. one of the things uh, they recommend is, you know, is to get out of your house, out of the office and go out in the, into the woods, onto the beach, on a hiking path, anywhere where there's plants, there's dirt. So you can go barefoot on the beach, even better, you know, get some wind in your face and sun and rain and, you know, kind of commune with nature, even if it's only 20 minutes or an hour, or whatever, just something, and that does seem to affect people in a way. And I do wonder if, you know, it kind of, if maybe it's only metaphorical, but it, it is kind of a panpsychism. You know, these trees are alive, the dirt, all this is interactive. It's a whole ecosystem. I'm part of it, but it takes you out of your own little ego and goes, man, I'm part of this, you know, sort of like why I enjoy going into um, astronomical domes. I feel the same way there as I do in a, in a, a European cathedral. Even though I'm an atheist, I go into, my, my wife's from Cologne, we go in the big dome there and I get the same feeling there, even though I don't believe any of this stuff, but just the way it's designed and the, the vaults and the stained glass windows, the light pouring in and the candles. And it, it really does have that effect. And I, I think if nothing else. You're onto something for what actually does drive people to feel awe. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so the final chapter, I do talk, go into some depth about, the implications for human existence and talk about spiritual advancement and what that could consist in and give a kind of very broad brushstrokes theory of, of what that might mean. Spiritual communities, the need for spiritual communities, you know, this is one of the things the secular world hasn't mm -hmm. managed to replicate. In a religious mm -hmm. community, you come together to mark the seasons, to mark the rites of passage, birth, death, marriage, coming of age, bringing the community together, uh, not just because you've got a common interest and you like hanging out, but just because you're neighbors, you know, um, connecting to some political idea of progress on earth. You know, I think making a connection between progress on earth and progress in the universe. And um, yeah, so I think we need to work out in a perhaps a post-religious age, how to think about our relationship with nature, our relationship with creativity, or as you say, and how that connects to the broader human struggle. So yeah, there's a lot of work to do. I mean, I suppose I'm quite passionate about the, the, the spiritual but non-religious is a huge demographic, but academics, they're not catered for by academics, right? Philosophers are mostly secular atheists, but there there is some really good philosophy of religion, but it tends to be almost exclusively very traditional Christians, uh, a few Jews as well, you know, but uh, that's about it, really. Um, there's very little what you might call sort of liberal philosophy of religion of the, between these two, these two, you know, fa it's fantastic that, you know, I've not got a problem with either secular atheism or traditional religion. But there's a huge neglected middle ground. And um, yeah, I mean, I've got a Templeton project at the moment on panpsychism and panentheism. And th oh, this is what funded the recent conference uh, right. that Sean and I debated. But this is part of my desire to 
really open up a new realm of study here and or i mean it's not non-existent but i heard william lane craig talking recently about you know because there has been a development in philosophy of religion and there's some great philosophy of religion going on and william lane craig was bemoaning why hasn't this got out to the broader population and i think you know part of the reason is it often doesn't fit with liberal ethics you know people are not going to say oh it's you know you can't be gay or something whereas if there was a sort of liberal spiritual but not religious you know, so be- because academics don't cater for it, there is this perception it's fluffy thinking and, you know, Deepak Chopra and, you know, it's, uh, I, I like, I mean, not that I've got a problem with Deepak. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good, and, well, anyway, I'll stop there. But um, <laughs> there's, uh, but, you know, that's just contingent circumstance that academics haven't done it. There's, I, I, I'm trying to, one of the things I'm trying to show with this book is you can do rigorous, careful, scientifically informed defenses of, of, what you might call a spiritual but not religious position. That's part of what yeah. I'm trying to do with the book. Uh, well, you did, and I think it's an important contribution to that, and there's going to be more need for that as the rise of the nuns continues and the secularization of, of the West, anyway, uh, continues almost unabated. I mean, I think it, with Gen Z, I Jenners, maybe 50% in America have no religious affiliation at all. Now, they're not necessarily subscribing to Skeptic Magazine or or joining Richard Dawkins' atheism group, but uh, you know, but but they're not following mainstream. So what are they going to do? You know, d- is there a need to fill? Is there a niche that needs to be filled? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. So interesting question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Philip, that's a good place to end. There, we right up on two hours here. We, we're one half of a Joe Rogan episode, so that's long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michael. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. That was great. Thanks for your work and thanks for your book.